Hey, it's Jeff Hyman, your startup therapist, where we focus on the people part of startups. I'm joined today by Pat Friel. Hey, Pat. Hey, Jeff. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Pat, you're a managing partner with Lachlan Partners, a retained executive search firm based in Washington, D.C. Correct. And uh, today, for the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to get really in-depth on interviewing and assessing candidates and how to make sure that you find the absolute rock star for your company. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we do. Let me briefly introduce you. Uh, I know you had a, a, an illustrious career at Hydric and Struggles, one of the top uh, executive search firms in the world. You actually ran their Washington, D.C. office? That's correct. I did. And now you're at Lachlan Partners, which is a boutique uh, search firm, correct? Yeah, I've been at Lachlan for the last three years. Okay, great. Uh, most of your work is technology, professional services, government, nonprofit kind of work. Uh, and I know you do a lot of senior level stuff. So this is going to be very helpful I think for a lot of our viewers who are building out their leadership teams. Absolutely. All the stuff that we do, Jeff, is usually at that C level. You know, it's the CEO or reports to the board or reports to the, the chief executive officer. Great. Perfect. Uh, so you do a lot of work with VCs and, and boards of directors as well. Correct. Let's get right into it. And I guess, you know, I'll, I'll start with uh, an obvious question. How do you know a rock star candidate when you see one? Now, Regardless of sector, industry, function, how much experience they have, are there any DNA that you have seen, that you've identified, as consistently present within rock star talent? Well, I, I don't know them when I see them. I have to talk to them. Okay, let's assume we have, have you talked to them. <laughs> so, but, you, you know, I, I think there are, there are several things to, to think about when you're considering if the candidate's a rock star. Um, you know, and, and in no particular order, I mean, first and foremost, we're looking for that strong leadership profile. Someone who's demonstrated throughout their career, they've been able to move the needle in a variety of environments is really, I, I think, one of the, the key attributes of, of, of that rock star candidate. And we get to that by, by interviewing and doing the deep dive, you know, employing, Jeff, and I'm, I know you're familiar with this term, a competency-based sure. assessment, where, where you want to peel back the onion to make sure that they, they have contributed to the level that they say they have. But, but let's just assume we get there. Not just looking at the companies they were at or the industries they worked in. You really want to understand the impact they made. Exactly. I mean, when you look at a resume of a rock star or a non-rock star, they actually all look the same. You know, you know they, right. they use very similar terms in, in describing their contributions. And, and I think the key for us is getting from the we to the me. You know, you know everyone sort of talks about their uh, accomplishments and, you know, broad brush strokes and and to me, that that's something that really sort of sort of sends my uh, spidey sense tingling, and I want to dig in and learn more about what that person's contribution was. But you're looking for someone who's had kind of that that strong leadership profile, has moved the needle, and has made people happy, whether inter inside the company or outside the company. So either their boss or investors. Um, s secondly, I think with with the rock star candidates, you know, you need to find someone that have people. Follow. Mm. Okay, so so you want to see you know definite sort of in that leadership perspective. I like to see uh, a leader that people have followed to different to different places because that tells you what it tells us that people have confidence in that executive. That executive can get ex that those executives can get excited about what that leader has to espouse, and they think the person is going to be successful. Got where it. They have, where they have been. So it's it's proof. It, it's not proof positive, but it's a good indication. Yeah that if they're able to inspire and attract people to join them again, that they're on to something. Absolutely. And then people bet on rock stars. So, so being able to see, again, a track record of, of investors and support from outside the organization, so beyond the employees, from people who have taken a, an objective look at that executive and what they want to accomplish in the business and have decided to bet on them. And quality matters. I mean, you know, so so the better the uh, the private equity firm or the venture capital firm that's really bet, I think the higher the stock rises. So so if you've got a person who's moved through and if people have followed and people have put money into and and they continue to do that, right, that's probably a rock star. So all, all this sounds really good at a high level. Let's be as practical as we can for a moment. You've done. I'm guessing thousands, tens of thousands of interviews of candidates over the years. I think so. There's probably questions you've learned that are predictive of a candidate's success and probably questions that are a waste of time and you don't understand why anyone asked them. Can you give us examples of both so that if, if we can't afford a search firm or we're doing a search on our own, maybe for a mid-level person, 
what questions should we be asking that actually are predictive of the candidate's success? Yeah, so, so look, I think questions around uh, what you want to do with that candidate is you want to engage them so they tell you a story and, and you understand where, the, where, where they've been and where they're headed or where they, where they got to. So, so I like to use example-based questions to really kind of drill down. Tell me about a time where you took over a project uh, where you had great success. What did you do? What were the steps that you took? What happened? And if you, if you had to do it again, would you change anything? You can reverse that question and talk about a business failure because I think executives learn a lot about things that don't, that don't work out. So, so in, in particular, the more important part of that question is what would they do differently? Right. What have they learned? Uh, I, I'm interested in, in, in learning about everything Jeff should be based on something that happened. I'm, I'm not really, hypothetical questions. I'm not interested in philosophy. I'm yeah. not interested in hypothetical. Yeah. I'm interested in sort of that, that path that they took to get from A to B and how hard it was. With, with one exception, I, I like to understand how candidates, uh, how str particularly with a CEO, how, strat how they approach strategy and vision. When they know they're on the right track with the strategy, more importantly, when they know that they're not, how they set a vision that people will follow, how do they check in, how do they know if, they, if they've gotten, if their vision is, is, has kind of migrated into the unrealistic point. Good candidates can answer these questions. Hypotheticals, um, you know, um, philosophy questions, th those are challenging questions. It's, it's fun to talk about those things. Like if we went to Starbucks, that's a great afternoon. Yeah, but they're just not predictive. It's, it's just, yeah. just not going to help you in, in, in evaluating a candidate. What about when it comes to roles that are, say, a VP of sales, and, yeah. and the, per the candidates are just such good talkers, and they do this for a living? Um, how do I really peel the onion skins to get to the, the, the underlying facts as opposed to the schmaltz around it? Yeah, I, I always joke, I, when, I, when I train young recruiters, I, I let them know that and, and I don't mean this in, in, in a bad way. I think in, in interviews, people are trying to present themselves in, in the best possible light. But, but the advice that I always give our, our younger recruiters is the candidate's always lying about something. You, you have to figure out what the lie is. When it comes to sales candidates, it's, it's slightly reversed. They're rarely telling the truth. You have to, finish, you have to figure out what the truth is about. Sales candidates are, are, are a tough nut to, uh, to crack. But, but the one thing that I find really sort of uh, – Sort of separates the wheat from the shaft because they always tell a good story is the compensation question. Great salespeople make lots of money. They've been rewarded handsomely throughout their career. And Jeff, I find to get to the bottom of the of the sales executive, to, to, to decode the sales executive, you've got to go through the, the interview and talk about what they've accomplished. And it's, it's always going to sound great. But but where it all where I'm able to connect point A and point B is when they talk about compensation. But what, what sales, happens if they got lucky? What happens if a bluebird landed in their lap, or, sure. or they inherit? They, let's say they inherited a great pipeline. And, that's one. That's one paycheck. Okay. Oh, I you see. Know. You're looking at the pattern yeah, over time. Exactly. You know, you go through the compensation history. Tell me about your best three years from a compensation got perspective. It. Not your best one. I know this sounds silly, but do you actually ask the CW twos of sales reps? I, you know, I, I interviewed a sales candidate one time who made uh, one year $1.2 million. And he was so proud of that, he actually carried his W-2 in his wallet. <laughs> Laminated. So, yeah, you, you can, you know, I, 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 I'm usually not as bold to say, hey, can you show me the W-2? But I, I'm sh I make sure that they understand before they leave the meeting with me that they're going to uh, have to uh, verify compensation at some point in time. I, I understand. Um, let's switch gears a little bit, and let's talk about who I'm targeting for a, for a position. Again, let's assume maybe I, I'm not using a search firm or I'm thinking about using a search firm. Sure. And I'm hiring our first, uh, well, our first head of sales. Okay. Uh, since we're on that theme. Am I looking for someone who is currently a head of sales or would you argue that there's no reason that, that the person would take a lateral move from a VP of sales position to my VP of sales position or instead, should I be looking for someone where this role is really a bit of a stretch, but that person has achieved a, a great track record and a rock star status at a lower level, and this is a, a move up? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying, getting at? Yeah, I, yeah, I do, and, and I'm, I'm going to give the old sort of hedge answer. It, it depends. I think both can be really good candidates. 
you know, I think when you when you engage a recruiter, you know, we're always looking to find that person you didn't think you could get. So, so going after that higher level executive, provided they have the skill sets. I mean, a vice president of sales is a great example of a job where the larger the organization you're in, the more of a management yeah. job yeah. that that really is. And you know, usually in a startup, the content in a sales job is to beat the street, to get out, and to move the product or the service on behalf of the company. Right. So, uh, so in that scenario that you described, I mean, there's lots of great options for those rising rock stars. I think the caveat is is to make sure that they have the the skill set that you're looking for. If you are in fact looking for someone to build the team, let's make sure they've done that before you put them in the role. I, I won't want them to learn to build a team. Right. Uh, you know, learning to sell more product or a different product, I think that's a good bet. So they've ha- they've got the competencies, they've demonstrated they can do it. It doesn't really matter necessarily Correct. whether it's a lateral or a move up. I think so. What about uh, skills versus fit or competencies versus cultural fit? How do you how do you weigh and measure those two? If you have a candidate who, on paper or even in interviews, is a closer uh, s- skill set match but maybe a bit odd or unusual, maybe they're not a perfect culture fit, they're a little introverted, whatever, versus the inverse. How do you how do you make that decision? Yeah, I mean, my advice would be in a small company, in a company that's really moving um, and, and, and really kind of pushing, fit is more important than skills. You, you know, uh, I, I think in a, in a smaller company when you have fewer personalities and, and, and less infrastructure, Jeff, I think it almost has to be the, the closer to perfect the fit is, the better. And I think just small moves away from that really add risk into the equation. So this is fascinating. Can you elaborate on, and I'm sure you've seen the movie before, what uh, what are those risks that are increased if it's not a great fit? Yeah. You know, I, th- I have seen so many, so many CEOs and boards get excited about a resume, you know, back to the beginning of our conversation. And, and they, they undervalue the culture that the person exists in. So, you know, if you think of a great sales organization like a Procter & Gamble and you've got a startup and, and they see this candidate and they get very excited about the background, yep. not quite sure about fit. I mean, there are so many things in, in from, a, from a fit perspective that that person has become accustomed to, they've, that uh, they've gotten used to, expectations that they have. And in a startup, you know, all that stuff goes out the window. I, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of times isn't the infrastructure that someone's used to. There aren't people there to do things, and that really gets exasperated in these smaller companies. So if fit is on the margin, uh, higher priority than competencies and skills and experience, you described clearly how to interview for the latter. How do I interview or figure out if the person's a fit? I'm guessing you're going to say take them to dinner, but aside from that, how do I figure out if the person is is really a fit? It's... It's tough. I mean, I think it, I think most organizations are challenged, uh, and it, it it is the part of the process, Jeff, that I think most execs will take a shortcut on. They'll say, you know what, I did go to dinner with them, and the person he or she seems like a great person, and I think they're going to be a fit. They'll say, I like that guy. Right. I, I, so so my guess is, is I don't have great questions for that, but I think you need to expose that person to as many people in your organization as you can. And, and really start to involve people in their persp- and get their perspective on whether they think the person's going to be a fit. And then I think it's incumbent on the hiring manager to spend probably two to three times more time with that person than they think they need to. So we're repetition over time to see if the person's right. consistent, et cetera. How do I prevent this from turning into one big mess where I've got a lot of people in the company that have interviewed this person or met with this person, everyone's got an opinion, presumably they got to meet multiple candidates. So even setting aside how time intensive it is, just everyone's got their own favorites and it, it turns into a voting mess. It can and it, it might not. I like to use the analogy of the Christmas tree. You know, when, when you're involving your team in an interview process, uh, you know, you have to approach it like you're, you're, you're decorating your Christmas tree. Everyone can put a decoration on the tree if they want, but it's my tree if I'm the hiring manager. Got it. So, so, so really kind of, kind of letting the, the – um, your, your colleagues know that here's where we are in the process. I'm very serious about this candidate. This isn't a veto session, but I really want your honest, honest read. Don't come back to me and say he's not qualified because I already think he's qualified. I'm interested in fit and, and really set expectations around what you want the feedback. Got it. Let's talk about uh, reference checking. So, so many times 
I see references as an afterthought that's done after the decision's already made, frequently after the offer letter already goes out. Um, and then, of course, you're, you're hoping and praying you don't hear anything other than this candidate is fantastic. Uh, how should reference checking be done so that it's actually useful? Yeah, I think you need to be checking, checking references throughout the process. Uh, you know, if you're managing a, a search process and, and you're, you know, you're, you're running a company, this, this is difficult, but, but, it, but it's important. Uh, understanding, there, there's lots of great tools. I mean, you know, if, if you'd have told me 20 years ago, Jeff, there'd be this database with 100 million people in it and, and people would update their own records at it. So right. There's no way. But, but, you know, it's easy to figure out if you're connected to somebody. So connecting with someone on LinkedIn immediately as they involve in your process isn't, it's great. It's always good to expand your professional network, but you'll be able to see the points of connection. And there's people out there that you can probably go out and, and connect with. No, you don't want to expose the candidate. You want to do it in a way that's reasonable. But, but you know, there, there are questions that, a, that an executive can ask someone in their network. Hey, I see that you used to work at an XYZ company. How was the sales function? Or, or just general right. terms where you start to, un, start to be able to paint a picture. So when you get to that point of formal reference checking, You've had a couple checkpoints. This is and, a, and just so I'm clear, Pat, you're saying I'm doing this along the throughout the process with multiple candidates. Yeah, I, so, I, I would. I, I think you know, you you what, what we try to do, Jeff, is is at the outset we try to connect with someone we're familiar with or someone that we know, and I just want to get a good guy, bad guy read. Right. I, I'm not interested in understanding developmental areas. I'm not interested in understanding sort of you know uh, uh, their accomplishments. Good guy, bad guy, and 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 I can do it in a way where, where sometimes the people don't even know the questions get asked. Can you, can you elaborate? A good guy, bad guy sounds a little simplistic. I think I think I know where you're heading with it, but what what does that mean? Yeah, I I just want I want someone that I know and trust to tell me that someone they think highly of that okay. person. So it's like a thumbs up, thumbs down. Correct. You're not looking for the person to give you a ton of detail. No, but if you, you know, I, I'm not looking to understand what environment they work well in. I'm just looking. Top of the mind, read. Do you think this person's strong or not? Got it. Which which speaks to the importance of building your network throughout your career, so that you have this Rolodex of people to to look to. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think people think about networking when uh, when they, when they need to find a job. That's when most people are aware of it. But you know, to to work with that network and be able to help each other is it's it's a great way to leverage your network. Got it. Just in the in the couple minutes remaining, one last topic that comes up a lot, which is how to engage candidates that are not looking for a job, they're currently employed, doing great, and I'm interested in potentially attracting them to my startup. And I, let's again assume I'm doing the search myself, I can't afford a search firm. How do I get people to even have a conversation when they're currently working, they're well paid, they're successful? Why would they even consider moving to my startup? How do I get them even on the hook to listen to what might be a very compelling pitch? Yeah, assuming that you can get to them, and you know, I'd, I'd recommend leveraging your network or or going through through LinkedIn. I, I you know, I always I find most candidates are receptive to a conversation if you approach them in a professional way, if you can set a a, 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 a an expectation of how much of their time is going to be taken up, and and you, and there are no real real strong expectations of the process. So an email or an email that says, hey. You know, can you spend ten minutes with me? I'm I'm working on an interesting thing. I'd like to run by you. Usually, get some. Usually, is a great way to approach. And I find that most people will make ten minutes for someone. And just so I'm clear, are you saying I should approach them as I want to get your thoughts on who might be interested, or are you saying I I looked at your background. I'd like to talk to you about the role for you. I, I think you can do either, but but I think the more um, the more open ended you leave it, I think the greater the possibility, Jeff, that they'll spend some time with you. If, Got it. If, if if it's a you want to, I, I always I always think you want to be able to have the chance to tell your story. So the broader that you go, you have the more opportunity to have that conversation where it's, hey, I'm interested in talking to you about this job. I right. mean, the, the the logical back, uh, you know, uh, back email might say, what job? Yeah. And, you know, I'm not interested. Yeah, in I'm not looking for a job. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Got it. So, so you want to keep it open-ended. Got it. And if they're not the right one, they might know people that are. So it's hopefully not a wasted conversation anyway. Yeah, the, the challenge is how do you manage all that, right? I mean, yeah. you, you know, that's a, there's, a, there's a technology challenge there for, for that exec as you start to get recommendations. Yeah, just logistics. Yep. Pat, this has been very helpful. How can people learn more about Lock, Lachlan or get in touch with you and learn more about your, your search practice? 
Sure. You can check us out on the web at uh, www.lachlanpartners.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Lachlan Partners. You can follow me at Recruit Freel, all, all one word. Uh, and if you're in Washington, let us know. Great. Pat, thank you very much for the time. Jeff, you're welcome. It was great seeing you. Thank you.